Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our 52 weeks of reading through the Bible. We're now at week 14, day number 7, coming to the end of week number 14. And we're in 2 Samuel still, and we're today reading chapters 13, 14, and 15. So three more chapters. And this is where David's life takes a dark turn. And it's the consequences of the actions between him and Bathsheba. We begin to see this. We begin to see the story that takes place, the events that take place. Chapter 13. So years have spanned. David's son, David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister named Tamar. And Amon, her half-brother, felt fell desperately in love with her. Amon became so obsessed with Tamar that he became ill. Well, she was a virgin, and Amon thought he could never have her. But Am Am Amnon had a very crafty friend, his cousin Jonadab. He was the son of David's brother Shimea. One day, Jonadab said to Amon, What's the trouble? Why should the son of a king look so dejected morning after morning? So Amnon told him, I am in love with Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Well, Jonadab said, I'll tell you what to do. Go back to bed and pretend you are ill. When your father comes to see you, ask him to let Tamar come and prepare some food for you. Tell him you'll feel better if she prepares it as you watch and feeds you with her own hands. So Ammon, Am, Am, Amnon lay down, pretended to be sick, and when the king came to see him, Amnon asked him, Please let my sister Tamar come and cook my favorite dish as I watch. Then I, then I can eat it from her own hands. So David agreed and sent Tamar to Amnon's house to prepare some food for him. When Tamar arrived at Amnon's house, she went to the place where he was lying down so he could watch her mix some dough. Then she baked his favorite dish for him. But when she set the serving tray before him, he refused to eat. Everyone, get out of here, Amnon told his servants, so they all left. Then he said to Tamar, Now bring the food into my bedroom and feed it to me here. So Tamar took his favorite dish to him. But as she was feeding him, he grabbed her and demanded, Come to bed with me, my darling sister. No, my brother, she cried. Don't be foolish. Don't do this to me. Such wicked things aren't done in Israel. Where could I go in my shame? and you would be called one of the greatest fools in Israel. Please, just speak to the king about it, and he will let you marry me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her, and since he was stronger than she was, he raped her. Then suddenly Amnon's love turned to hate, and he hated her even more than he had loved her. Get out of here, he snarled at her. No, no, Tamar cried. Sending me away now is worse than what you've already done to me. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. He shouted for his servant and demanded, Throw this woman out and lock the door behind her. So the servant put her out and locked the door behind her. She was wearing a long, beautiful robe, as was the custom in those days for the king's virgin, virgin daughters. But now Tamar tore her robe and put ashes on her head. And then, with her face in her hands, she went away crying. Her brother Absalom saw her and asked, Is it true that Amnon has been with you? Well, my sister, keep quiet for now since he's your brother. Don't worry about it. So Tamar lived as a desolate woman in her brother's Absalom's house. When King David heard what had happened, he was very angry. I mean, in a sense, David was part of allowing this to take place. And though Absalom never spoke to Amnon about this, 
He hated Amnon deeply because of what he had done to his sister. Well, two years later, when Absalom's sheep were, bearing, were being sheared at Baal Hazor near Ephraim, Absalom invited all the king's sons to come to a feast. He went to the king, to David, and said, My sheep shearers are now at work. Would the king and his servants please come to celebrate the occasion with me? The king replied, No, my son, if we all came, we would be too much of a burden on you. Absalom pressed him, but the king would not come, though he gave Absalom his blessing. Well then, Absalom said, If you can't come, how about sending my brother Amnon with us? Why Amnon? the king asked. But Absalom kept on pressing the king until he finally agreed to let all his sons attend, including Amnon. So Absalom prepared a feast for a king. Absalom told his men, wait until Amnon gets drunk, that at my signal, kill him. Don't be afraid. I'm the one who has given the command. Take courage and do it. So at Absalom's signal, they murdered Amnon. Then the other sons of the king jumped on their mules and fled. And as they were on the way back to Jerusalem, this report reached David. Absalom has killed all the king's sons. Not one is left alive. The king got up, tore his robe, and threw himself on the ground. His advisors also tore their clothes in horror and sorrow. But just then, Jonadab, the son of David's brother Shimei, arrived and said, No, don't believe all that the king's sons have been killed. It was only Amnon. Absalom has been plotting this ever since Amnon raped his sister Tamar. No, my lord the king, your sons aren't all dead. It was only Amnon. Meanwhile, Absalom escaped. Then the watchman on the Jerusalem wall saw a great crowd coming down the hill on the road from the west. He ran to tell the king, I see a crowd of people coming from Horonium Road along the side of the, hill, of the hill. Look, Jonadab told the king, there they are now, the king's sons are coming. Just as I said, they soon arrived, weeping and so sobbing, and the king and all of his servants wept bitterly with them. And David mourned many days for his son Amnon. Absalom fled to his grandfather, Talmai, son of Amihud, the king of Geshur. He stayed there in Gesher for three years. And King David, now, recon, now reconciled to Amnon's death, longed to be reunited with his son Absalom. So you see the tragedy. that I want you to see this from David's perspective. We usually would think of it from Absalom's perspective, and we would think, well, that's justified. But what did, what did Absalom do? He took vengeance in his own hand. It's murder. He was willing to take credit for it. That's violating the law of God. Now, Amnon's not innocent either. He raped his own sister. I mean, you're talking about wickedness to the core, and it gets worse, but look at it from David's perspective. Do you think he's reflecting on what was said to him by Nathan the prophet? That you're going to have trouble there are consequences. Chapter 14. Joab realized how much the king longed to see Absalom. So he sent for a woman from Tekoa who had a reputation for great wisdom. He said to her, Pretend you are in mourning. Wear mourning clothes and don't put on lotions. Act like a woman who has been mourning for the dead for a long time. Then go to the king and tell him the story I am about to tell you. Then Joab told her what to say. When the woman from Tekoa approached the king, she bowed with her face to the ground in deep respect and cried out, O oh, king, help me. What's the trouble? the king asked. Alas, I am a widow. She replied, My husband is dead. My two sons had a fight out in the field, and since no one was there to stop it, one of them was killed. Now the rest of the family is demanding, let us have your son. We will execute him for murdering his brother. He doesn't deserve to inherit his family family's property. They want to extinguish the only coal I have left, and my husband's name and family will disappear from the face of the earth. 
Leave it to me, the king told her. Go home, and I'll see to it that no one touches him. Oh, thank you, my lord, the king. The, women, the woman from Tekoa replied, If you are criticized for helping me, let the blame fall on me and on my father's house, and let the king and his throne be innocent. If anyone objects, the king said, Bring him to me. I can assure you he will never harm you again. Then she said, Please swear to me by the Lord your God that you won't let anyone take vengeance against my son. I want no more bloodshed. As surely as the Lord lives, he replied, not a hair on your son's head will be disturbed. Please allow me to ask one more thing of my lord the king, she said. Go ahead and speak, he responded. She replied, why don't you do as much for the people of God as you have promised to do for me? You have convicted yourself in making this decision because you have refused to bring home your own banished son. All of us must die eventually. Our lives are like water spilled out on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. But God does not just sweep life away. Instead, he devises ways to bring us back when we have been separated from him. Interesting statements, isn't it? I have come to plead with my lord the king because people have threatened me. I said to myself, perhaps, perhaps the king will listen to me and rescue us from those who would cut us off from the inheritance God has given us. Yes, my lord, the king will give us peace of mind again. I know that you are like an angel of God in discerning good from evil. May the Lord your God be with you. I must know one thing, the king replied, and tell me the truth. Yes, my lord the king, she responded. Did Joab put you up to this? And the woman replied, My lord the king, how can I deny it? Nobody can hide anything from you. Yes, Joab sent me and told me what to say. He did it to place the matter before you in a different light. But you are as wise as an angel of God, and you understand everything that happens among us. You want to know why I think he realized, put two to two together? Because Nathan did the same thing, in a sense. So the king sent for Joab and told him, All right, go and bring back the young man Absalom. But Joab bowed with his face to the ground in deep respect and said, at last I know that I have gained your approval, my lord the king, for you have granted me this request. Then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king gave this order. Absalom may go to his own house, but he must never come into my presence. So Absalom did not see the king. Now Absalom was praised as the most handsome man in all of Israel. He was flawless from head to foot. He cut his hair only once a year and then only because it was so heavy. When he weighed it out, it came to five pounds. That's heavy for hair. He had three sons and one daughter. His daughter's name was Tamar and she was very beautiful. Absalom lived in Jerusalem for two years, but he never got to see the king. Then Absalom sent for Joab to ask him to intercede for him, but Joab refused to come. Absalom sent for him a second time, but again Joab refused to come. So Absalom said to his servants, Go and set fire to Joab's barley field, the field next to mine. So they set his field on fire as Absalom had commanded. Then Joab came to Absalom at his house and demanded, Why did your servants set my field on fire? Absalom replied, Because I wanted you to ask the king why he brought me back from Geshur if he didn't intend to see me. I might as well have stayed there. Let me see the king. If he finds me guilty of anything, then let him kill me. So Joab told the king what Absalom had said. Then at last David summoned Absalom, who came and bowed low before the king, and the king kissed him. So there is somewhat of a reconciliation between Absalom and David, his father. But notice the controversy. Notice the drama of all that's taking place here. What David is seeing is God's judgment upon his family because of what he did. The whole bigger point of the story, spanning back previous chapters, is to help us see we need to make sure we follow the Lord. We need to make sure that we pay close attention to the Lord. Chapter 15. 
After this, Absalom brought, bought a chariot and horses, and he hired fifty bodyguards to run ahead of him. He got up early every morning and went out to the gate of the city. When people brought a case to the king for judgment, Absalom would ask where in Israel they were from, and they would tell him their tribe. Then Absalom would say, You've really got a strong case here. It's too bad the king doesn't have anyone to hear it. I wish I were the judge. Then everyone could bring their cases to me for judgment, and I would give them justice. When people tried to bow before him, Absalom wouldn't let them. Instead, he took them by the hand and kissed them. Absalom did this with everyone who came to the king for judgment, and so he stole the hearts of all the people of Israel. After four years, Absalom said to the king, Let me go to Hebron to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill a vow I made to him. For while your servant was at Geshur in Aram, I promised to sacrifice to the Lord in Hebron if he would bring me back to Jerusalem. All right, the king told him, go and fulfill your vow. So Absalom went to Hebron. But while he was there, he sent secret messengers to all the tribes of Israel to stir up a rebellion against the king. As soon as you hear the ram's horn, his message read, you are to say, Absalom has been crowned king in Hebron. He took 200 men from Jerusalem with him as guests, but they knew nothing of his intentions. While Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel, one of David's counselors who lived in Giloth, or Gilo. Soon many others also joined Absalom, and the conspiracy gained momentum. You see, Absalom, he wanted, as time went on, he would go out to the city gate and he would make friends with people. Hey, I can bring, they can bring their cases to me for judgment. I'll give them justice. He wouldn't let them bow before him, but then he would take them by the hand. He would kiss them. He was playing up to the people. When he goes to Hebron, what had been stirring in his heart, he wanted the kingship. Over those years he, that David wouldn't allow him to come into his presence, it built resentment. And even though they did kind of reconcile, he had no respect for his father. A messenger soon arrived in Jerusalem to tell David, all Israel has joined Absalom in a conspiracy against you. Then we must flee at once or it will be too late, David urged his men. If, if we don't go, they, Absalom's going to come with an army and kill as many people as possible. Hurry, if we get out of the city before Absalom arrives, both we and the city of Jerusalem will be spared from disaster. We are with you, his advisors replied. Do what you think is best. So the king and all of his household set out at once. He left no one behind except ten of his concubines to look after the palace. The king and all his people set out on foot, pausing at the last house, to let all the king's men move past to lead the way. There were six hundred men from Gath who had come with David, along with the king's bodyguard. Then the king turned and said to Ittai, a leader of the men from Gath, why are you coming with us? Go on back to King Absalom, for you are a guest in Israel, a foreigner in exile. You arrived only recently, and should I force you today to wander with us? I don't even know where we will go. Go on back and take your kingsmen with you, and may the Lord show you his unfailing love and faithfulness. But Ittai said to the king, I vow by the Lord and by your own life that I will go wherever my Lord the king goes, no matter what happens, whether it means life or death. So David replied, All right, come with us. So Ittai and all of his men and their families went along. Everyone cried loudly as the king and his followers passed by. They crossed the Kidron Valley and then went out toward the wilderness. Zadok and all the Levites also came along, carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. They, they set down the Ark of God, and Abathar offered sacrifices until everyone had passed out of the city. Then the king instructed Zadok to take the Ark of God back into the city. 
If the Lord sees fit, David said, he will bring me back to see the ark and the tabernacle again. But if he's through with me, then let him do what seems best to him. See, David is thinking that maybe God is done with him. Actually, Psalm 3 was spoken by David at the point when he's leaving Jerusalem. So the king also told Zadok the priest, Look, here is my plan. You and Abathar should return quietly to the city with your son Ahimaaz and Abathar's son Jonathan. I will stop at the shallows of the Jordan River and wait there for a report from you. So Zadok and Abathar took the ark of God back to the city and stayed there. David walked up the road to the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and his feet were bare as a sign of mourning. And the people who were with him covered their heads and wept as they climbed the hill. When someone told David that his advisor Ahithophel was now backing Absalom, David prayed, O oh Lord, let Ahithophel give Absalom foolish advice. When David reached the summit of the Mount of Olives where people worshipped God, Hushai the archite was, was waiting there for him. Hushai had torn his clothing and put dirt on his head as a sign of mourning. But David told him, If you go with me, you will only be a burden. Return to Jerusalem and tell Absalom, I will now be your advisor, O king, just as I was with your father's advisor in the past. Then you can frustrate and counter Ahithophel's advice. Zadok and Abathar the priests will be there. Tell them about the plans being made in the king's palace, and they will send their sons Ahimaaz and Jonathan to tell me what's going on. So it was David's friend Hushai returned to Jerusalem, getting there just as Absalom arrived. So even though David may be thinking, is God done with me? He wants the city to be safe. He wants himself to be removed. And he wants to see what God's going to do. But everything's still in place for David to be kept informed on what happens and what Absalom's movements might be. So this story is not over, but David is feeling the effects of what God said would happen to him. And we're going to have to keep reading. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we, we read these stories, we're reminded, constantly reminded of the, of the truth that we need to make sure we're following your word, that we're depending upon you for everything, for even truth, for life itself that there are consequences to disobeying you. There are consequences to doing that which is violation of who you are. Even as believers, Lord, we're not to trust in our own wisdom, lean on to our own understanding. We're to follow you, live for you, glorify you in all that we say and all that we do. And Lord, I pray that we do that. Continue to give us your wisdom in your direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.